So I thought we'd do something kind of fun today because uh, of the overpopularity to one sutta being the official way to meditate. So I wanted to go over the Satipatthana Sutta and try to clear up some weird ideas that have developed over a period of time with the Satipatthana Sutta. So I'm going to I'm going to read some and then I'm going to comment and see if you agree with what I'm saying. Thus, if I hurt, yeah, let me turn the light on first. What number is that, Bante? Ten. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country in the town of the Kurus named Kama Sadama. Basically, that town is named uh, Happy Action. That's, that's Kama Sadama. There he addressed the monks thus, monks, Venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Monks, this is the direct path for the purification of beings. I don't like that translation. It makes it sound like it's the only path but it is intertwined in all of the other ways that you practice the meditation. And I'll get to that in a bit. <clears throat> for surmounting sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the, attain the attainment of the true way. And I, instead of the true way, I change it to a true way. And that gives it more leeway when you, when you think about it. Namely, the four foundations of mindfulness. What are the four? Here, a monk abides, and they use the word contemplating the body as a body. And that translation, I don't really like too much because that means thinking about, and this meditation is not about thinking. It's about observing. So I'll change that word to observing the body as a body. And there are a lot of translations of this that change a couple of words and they translate it as a body in a body, which is completely confusing. And it puts it more in the realm of psychology than it does Buddhism, which isn't the same thing. That Sometimes they intertwine a little bit, but not much ardently fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides observing, feeling as feelings. Now Bhikkhu Bodhi, when he did the translation, he put an S on the end of feeling. And that implies emotion emotional feelings, and that's not what the Buddha was teaching. So there's, there's some mistakes that are being made. Now, don't get the idea that I think Bhikkhu Bodhi is not a great translator. He is, but we're all human beings, and we all have our own 
uh, we all have our own way of thinking about things. And this one is just a little bit off, not much. So I change that to feeling as feeling. Ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Covetousness, I like it. Grief, aversion, I don't like it. So we could actually even change those words if we wanted. He abides observing mind as mind, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Another translation for covetousness and grief is craving. Now, isn't that a different kind of way to look at it? Having given up craving and that changes your perspective about what this sutta is about. He abides observing mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Now, one of the things that uh, the phenomena that's been happening is people aren't getting results by thinking about the four, and thinking is, is the key problem. Thinking about the four foundations of mindful, thinking of mindfulness, thinking that they can uh, just take one of the foundations and make it work. I've heard people talking about, yeah, I'm doing chaita, nupasana, and everybody else around them goes, ooh, that's really tough. How do you do that with your daily activities? Well, it's like you're trying to make some bread and you're only using flour and you're not putting any exert or other ingredients in it to make it a successful loaf of bread. And then you wonder why it doesn't work. And then you keep trying and trying because you said in the Satipatthana Sutta it says this, but it's not the whole formula. These are interconnected. The body, you have to have a body. There are feelings, but it is pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neither painful nor pleasant. It's not emotional. And mind, you don't just watch mind until you are able to go deeper into the meditation. So it's not a, and you still need, the feeling is still there. And when there's contact, body is still there. So the mind objects, now one of the things that's really amazing is the uh, hindrances by most people that are practicing meditation, they treat hindrances like it's some kind of enemy and they try to suppress the hindrances and they try to push them down and they complain when there is some kind of a loud noise that quotes, disturbs my meditation.
Now, this is a major problem if you want to be successful with your meditation. All of these are part of being successful. And when you're practicing the four foundations of mindfulness correctly, you're using them so that your mind will not be so susceptible to hindrances. Now, again, you're, you're hearing me say the same thing over and over again, because it is so incredibly important. When Vipassana came to America, the Vipassana teachers thought that uh, keeping the precepts was too close to the Catholic religion where there was a lot of uh, rejection, fear, and uh, guilty feeling. So they didn't stress the importance of keeping the precepts. Now, the precepts are not laws that you have to follow, but they're suggestions that when you do follow the precepts, mind will become more clear and you'll be able to sit and more quickly get into your Um, object of meditation and stay with it, which a lot of people call concentration. And to be honest, it is a form of concentration, but it's not the same as what the Buddha taught. So I don't like to use the word concentration. I like to use the word collectedness because that's more accurate towards being successful with the meditation. Now, because the, the five hindrances are the first thing that's talked about when you're talking about mind objects, it's pretty important. But what is your instruction when a mind, a mind gets distracted? Oh, just ig ignore it or suppress it, push it away, stop it from coming up. And that gets you to practice wrong effort. That means you're trying too hard. And an awful lot of people that are practicing the other forms of meditation wind up with massive headaches and pressure in their heads. And you go to the teacher and you say, boy, I really got this headache and my mind is so active. And what do they tell you to do? Oh, it'll go away eventually. Don't, don't pay attention to it. Is that part of full awareness? Or are you getting into a different form of meditation that some people say is a form of self-hypnosis? And then you can develop this idea that you can sit with a quiet mind without having any disturbance at all. But that's the force of the concentration causing that to appear faster and it seems to work because the hindrances don't come up. The force of the concentration pushes it down. And that is not the path of the Buddha. Full awareness, think of that. 
What is full awareness supposed to be? Suppression? Something that makes your mind go and get real tight? It doesn't lead to the freedom and it reinforces the idea of I am that. Now, what's one of the first things that you hear when you when you practice meditation with other people? Anicca dukkha anatta. What is anatta? That's a big question for an awful lot of people. It means I'm not there. How can I not be there and be aware of it? Who's aware? And there's all of these kind of questions that come up. So it's a real amazing phenomena that so many people like to take the idea of the Buddha teaching uh, freedom and they want that to let go of that suffering, but they're not willing to try the way the Buddha suggests. So they go off on other paths and they, they might call it Buddhism. They might even read uh, some things from the suttas, but it's really confusing and it doesn't work very well. Now, when you come here and you practice, the first day, I'm gonna start showing you something different. I don't care how long people have been practicing meditation. I'm showing you something different. It's new, it's exciting, and it's old because this is closer to the original teaching of the Buddha himself. The Buddha, the first discourse that he gave was the Eightfold Path, among other things. And in that Eightfold Path is very clear instruction in how to practice the way he's showing. Now he was showing people that had been doing meditation for a long time. They've been doing all kinds of different things. They even pushed him away because they he wouldn't continue on when he saw it didn't work. When he came back, he had to convince them that there is a different way and the way is the Eightfold Path, but it's a different way. It's a middle way of looking at things. A lot of people think that that's just surface stuff, but it was actually incredibly deep because the Eightfold Path is the middle way. It's a middle way that eliminates, gets rid of that false belief in a personal self, anicca, dukkha, anatta, anatta. Now, a lot of people say anatta, A means no, atta is self. And that's as far as they go with the definition. So I give it a different definition. Anatta is the impersonal way of seeing life. 
Uh, this gets all confused because there's an awful lot of people that they say, well, you have to be mindful. For years, literally uh, more than 20 years, my teachers, when I ask them what mindfulness is, uh, just be aware. Well, what in the world is that supposed to mean? You're supposed to know what that definition means. And now you have a whole lot of different definitions and that confuses everything. When you look at dependent origination, you see that this is a process of the way the Buddha describes how this all works. This is a process. And it's not a personal process. It's not something that's owned by me. It's just a scientific way of looking at how this life process works. Now, let's get back to the definition of mindfulness. With the understanding I just gave you, this will make complete sense. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. That's another way of saying it's a way of remembering because you have to keep your attention on your object of meditation pretty well. You have to keep your attention there to be able to observe that this is a process. And it's an impersonal process, anatta. No, because everything is so intertwined. I want you to go back to the Satipatthana Sutta and look at the instructions in meditation that the Buddha gives for mindfulness of breathing. But it's not only mindfulness of breathing. It's every kind of meditation that the, the, the Buddha taught. This is the instruction. Now, when you get to this section of the Satipatthana Sutta, this is part of observing the mind or body as a body. When breathing in, Long, he understands, I breathe in long. When breathing out long, he understands, I breathe out long. While breathing in short, he understands, I breathe in short. While breathing out short, he understands, I breathe out short. Now, when you're given instruction in mindfulness of breathing, Does it say that you focus someplace in your body? Does this say you only pay attention to the breath and suppress or ignore anything else? Is the nose or the abdomen or the upper lip, is that talked about? Is that mentioned in this instruction? No. Why? Because it's not there. Why did we start teaching differently from the first set of the instruction? And yes, 
I was taught that way for 20 years by myriad different meditation teachers because I was doing mindfulness of breathing. To the exclusion of the other parts of the Satipatthana Sutta. I was supposed to focus on that. And I was supposed to focus so deeply that I would see the beginning of the in-breath, the middle of the in-breath, and the going out of the in-breath. Then the pause, and then breathing in. So I was supposed to keep my attention on that to the exclusion of every, every other part of the Satipatthana Sutta. And that is why a lot of people are practicing one-pointed concentration. Because they believe that this is the way that the Buddha taught. And they don't investigate and see, well, what's the rest of the instruction? They don't investigate that at all. So it's a pretty interesting phenomenon that over the years, the Buddha's teaching actually pretty much disappeared. And as a result, a lot of the different people that wanted to follow the Buddha's path and the Buddha's philosophy, they began to change things around to suit what they thought was what the Buddha was talking about. And they added weird things into it because they weren't processing, processing, I don't like that word very much, they weren't experiencing be becoming arahats and they still wanted people to come and follow what they thought the Buddha was teaching. They developed this idea of a bodhisattva. Now, what is a bodhisattva vow? A vow taken to become a future Buddha. And then the philosophies got going more and more. And then it, it just turned into a thing where you don't even expect to become awakened because you've taken the bodhisattva vow. The bodhisattva vow stops you from experiencing Nibbana in this lifetime. So all of these things are so much intertwined that people have become attached to it. And of course, they're going to ignore any other person that doesn't agree with what they're doing. That's kind of the nature of, of life. And as a result, we, we lose this simple instruction of the meditation and take on a much more difficult kind of meditation. It's kind of interesting because, uh, uh, for instance, somebody just wrote me a letter on the email and they said, you know, I practice Goenka style meditation and I'm not putting down Goenka by saying this. This is just the fact that he practiced that. And he had fear every time he sat down to meditate and he practiced it for 20 years because he had such confidence in a teacher and 
it didn't lead to what he thought it should lead to. And he had this fear for 20 years. And then he began, he ran across uh, some YouTubes that I give talks on. And he started to see that he was causing that fear in himself because he was taking it personally. And now he doesn't have fear. And he's so thankful. That's how we get misguided in doing a lot of the different things because we have confidence in the, I, I think it's kind of a, a personality um, attachment that we get to other teachers. Well, seems that he's right. He's saying a lot of the words that I agree with, so he must be right. Now, when you come and teach, you'll hear me say, I don't want you to believe a word I say. I want you to experience what I'm talking about and judge for yourself whether it's the correct path or not. You have to take that responsibility for yourself. And if you want to add this or that from some other meditation because it seemed to work and, and your practice isn't going very well, then look at that and tell yourself, well, you know, I've been trying this and it didn't work. Maybe if I try something else and completely follow that suggestion, that you're going to be successful. I'm not a proselytizer. I'm not trying to get you to do something that you don't want to do for yourself. You are your own teacher and you're teaching yourself by direct practice. All I'm asking you to do is investigate a new way completely, like taking all of the Satipatthana Sutta and using them instead of just taking part and then doing something else with it. Just see for yourself. I'm not here to criticize another person's way. Are there advantages to doing the meditation the way you do it? Some of them. Some of them, they can be not such good advantages. It's up to you what you're doing. So please don't criticize me and say that I'm against this other person. I'm not. I mean, I've even gone so far as to be in Goenka's house in India and at this is after he died and talk with his brother about meditation. And it was very cordial. We didn't argue. We didn't fight. We didn't say this way is the way and that way is supposed to be the way. And, and we, we got along famously because we were able to listen to each other and then was willing to change a little bit and see if it helped. And now they're starting to teach Goenka in a different way that doesn't push as hard, doesn't need as much energy. And they're starting to see more and more that they are having more joy come up into their life. They're not following exactly these instructions, 
but they did incorporate the relaxed step, which is letting go of craving. So let's get back to the actual instructions. Now the key word that is pretty much ignored with you understand when you take a long breath and when you take a short breath, the word that's pretty much misunderstood is the word misunderstand. It doesn't say focus. It says, you know when you're breathing and you don't have to focus any place in your body. You know when you take a breath. You know when it's long. You know when it's short. That's all it, uh, that's all it means. You don't have to add any other instruction to that. It means pay attention so you understand when you're breathing and how your breathing is short or subtle or gross and big, you know. The next part is the actual instruction. It's only two sentences. I sh he trains thus. I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body of breath. Now, the of breath is not in the actual sutta. It's the whole body. You know what's happening in your body. You know, when you're sitting and you get a pain, you know it's there. You, you're practicing this part of the meditation. Now, the thing that is <clears throat> important to understand is the Buddha gave us the perfect instruction in how to handle different things that happen in the body. And that is to use the six R's. Now I say the six R's because that's an easier way to understand what right effort actually is. Right effort is four parts. You can read that in a lot of different books and such, but what to do with them is not in those books because they say suppress, push away, stop, fight with, or try to just leave it there by itself. Right effort is first recognizing when your mind is not on your object of meditation. Second, release that distraction. What does that mean? It means as soon as you see that your mind is pulled away from that, let it be there by itself. Don't get involved in thinking about what that distraction is. That just means that it's going to keep coming back and it's going to get bigger and more intense as you Put your attention on it as you feed it with your attention. So you don't make a big deal out of any kind of distraction. You allow it to be there by itself and don't keep your attention on it anymore. 
if you don't feed it with your distraction, it's going to go away by itself. Next, you relax. Now, what is a distraction? Where did the distraction come from? The distraction came from past unwholesome activity. In other words, you broke a precept. Now you see why I was talking about precepts earlier. Now you see what's the cause of every distraction. Well, what happens when you break a precept? You have a tiny little voice in your mind that says, I shouldn't have done that. And you feel guilty. So every distraction is an old feeling of guilt that you identified with, that you took personally. I shouldn't have done that. Now, we've all broken precepts. We've all broken all of the precepts at some point or another in some lifetime or other. We don't have to know what the precept is that we broke. What we need to do is recognize that it's there, let it be there by itself, and relax. Relax the tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. Now, a lot of you have heard me talk about the meninges and how that's just a bag that goes over the brain. Every time you have a hindrance arise, your brain expands and causes subtle tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. And actually, it extends to the meninges that goes around your spine. So we're talking about the whole body. Now you relax. How do you relax? You let it be there by itself without keeping your attention on it. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, that's half of right effort. What's the other part or parts? Bringing up something wholesome. Now, let me back up a little bit. When you relax that tension and tightness, you'll notice in your mind, you don't have any thoughts. You don't have any distractions. Your mind is alert without a lot of effort. And your mind is pure because you have let go of that false belief in a personal self. You have let go of craving. Pretty amazing. So when you put a smile into your practice, you're doing a couple of things at the same time that you don't really notice that much, but after a period of time, you do notice it. The more you smile, and I'm talking about all the time smile. I'm not talking about just sitting. But the more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes, the better your ob observation power becomes, the easier it is to recognize when your mind starts to get tight. And you recognize it more easily and 
you use the six R's and you recognize that your mind's starting to get tight and you allow it to be there and relax. So smiling is a major part of the practice that's not talked about too much in, in the Buddhist texts. But it is talked about. And it is implied in the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering. What's the opposite expression of suffering? What's the opposite of that? Smiling, being happy. Now, smiling is kind of misunderstood. I know that there are some meditation teachers that they've heard about smiling enough. They'll tell you, okay, smile. Then I'll give that in the first day of the instruction and not talk about it again. And they also will talk about more about relaxing but they'll just tell you that one time and then that you're on it for the rest of the meditation. They don't emphasize it near enough to be successful. But you hear me talk about it a lot because I think it's that important and practicing right effort every time you smile Every time you use the six R's, you are practicing the entire eightfold path at that time. So you're on the right path. Kind of amazing to think how, how intertwined everything really is and how you can do so much in such a, such a simple way. Oh, I know a lot of people that practice one-pointed concentration or they don't like to call it that, whatever kind of concentration that they don't have a relaxed step in. And they will defend it. This is the right way when they start to practice just out of curiosity to see if it works or not, and their mindfulness is strong enough, they're going to see every time they relax, there's pressure that's being let go of that they didn't see before. And they will start to be more successful with the meditation. Now, they've been practicing a form of mindfulness. That's not what the Buddha taught, but it, it's a form of mindfulness, and their mindfulness is strong enough to be able to recognize, oh, this is different. This is nice. I like it. Now, one of the things that, that's been going around with so many teachers is they like to talk more about suffering than how to get rid of the suffering. And that's, that's a pretty remarkable thing. And a lot of people walk around saying Buddhism is some form of pessimism. And that's the opposite of what it's, what's really happening. But because an awful lot of people, the monks and that sort of thing, English is their second language. They don't understand the subtleties of there is suffering in life and they don't understand the difference between that and all life is suffering, which is pretty big. My whole career as a monk has been dedicated 
to the idea that the meditation is supposed to be fun. It's okay to laugh. I've had students that are really gifted artists in one form or another quit because they thought Buddhism was more important. And when I get a hold of them, I, I why do you, why are you quitting? Why are you not doing more of your artwork? Why aren't you being more creative? Well, all life is suffering and I'm supposed to suffer. So I, I really do a good job of that. I have a friend that quit. He had a, a master's in music. And he quit his music. And he suffered a lot because of it and felt guilty any time he picked up his instruments to play it. <clears throat> when I started talking to him, I convinced him that that was the wrong idea. And then he started to get it, especially when I got him to start practicing the six R's. I hadn't seen him for 20 years. We had a connection that was remarkable. But he got this idea that he was supposed to suffer, so he was going to do the best he could at it. And he did not have a happy life. He had moments of happiness, of course, everybody does. But it's just the misunder misunderstanding of the translation. So when I convinced him he was supposed to uh, have joy and have joy while he was playing his instrument, right after that, he practiced it. He had a lot more joy in his life. And he got into a con uh, uh, orchestra playing professionally. And he had pushed that away because he wanted to get off the wheel of sansara. Just because he followed what the teacher said to do, not what the Buddha said to do. Now, I, I hear comments about this is Vimala Ramsey's way of doing things. No, it's not my way. I'm only a guide. You're your own teacher. You learn how to teach yourself from direct experience and then observe whether it's working or not. And when it does, you get excited. And you go, okay, let's do that some more. This is nice. This is fun. And this is the way it's supposed to be. It's not my way. What I get to do is observe your successes. And that makes me ecstatically happy. but you're taking the responsibility to change. You want to change because you're suffering and you're willing to change, to let go of those old habits that have a tendency to pull you down, have a tendency to make you depressed, have a tendency to make you fearful. or filled with anxiety. This man that wrote, and this was just a couple days ago, 
He said, for 20 years, I have had panic attacks. 20 years of panic attacks, being afraid of something, whatever it was. And now, after a couple of years of practicing this, not coming to the center, he wouldn't take that long. But he did it on its own, and he has no panic attacks arising anymore. How sweet is that? And that gets my juices going. Because that's just an affirmation that what he is doing is correct. And what the Buddha taught really does work. can't get any better than that. It's exciting to see people that have been so hard on their self for so many years and criticize their self that they really hate themselves. And they get caught in the psychological stuff about the way you overcome it is just by reliving it over and over and over and over again for years, and then you finally won't have any reaction to it. That's psychology. But when you follow the Buddha and his Four Noble Truths and Four Foundations of Mindfulness, your progress is fast. You don't have to suffer for years and years and years. You learn by having a light mind. Your light mind is alert. Your light mind is pure. And the more you practice it, the better you get at it until it becomes a habit. And what happens after that? You start developing more and more equanimity in your mind. You have more, more balance. You don't have to do the psychological things like beating on a pillow to get rid of your anger, which really makes your anger bigger and more intense, doesn't make it go away. But you feel some relief when you finally let it go in your mind. And then you go, well, that seemed to work. But how long does it work? Until the next situation that anger comes up. Now, you haven't been mindful of it. You haven't been aware of it. You've let your mind dictate how to control what you're doing while you're doing it. And quite often, that leads to a state of remorse and sadness and problems for yourself. Well, you don't need to have years of sadness or fear or anxiety to overcome it. That's not why you're here. Somebody just asked me, well, I'm alive, but why? Why am I here? And I told him that the reason you're here is to learn and to be happy. Yeah, but there's so much bad stuff happening in the world. Well, th that's his world. There's bad stuff happening, yes. But it doesn't have to affect you in a negative way. You can have balance without getting caught in what the dependent origination calls bhava. 
Now, I give it a different definition than other people. I've talked to a lot of very, very advanced monks about this, and they agree with me that it is a better definition than existence. What is that supposed to mean? Or becoming, what is that supposed to mean? I call it habitual emotional tendency. Sometimes I throw emotional in there, sometimes I don't. But it's your habitual tendency. That's what you get caught with. When you try to think your feeling and try to control your feeling with your thoughts, it don't work. But you get attached to doing it in the same way over and over and over again. And then you run to a medical doctor and said, please give me some pills so I won't be depressed. And they give you pills and it dulls you out. So you walk around like a zombie and you're not so depressed, but you're not so happy either. I get people complaining to me because they say it's harder to get rid of this stuff than what you're saying. But it isn't really. Not if you're sincere in change. Now, there are some people that come and they don't want to change. And if they're not willing to change their perspective and way of doing things, if they want to keep to the old way of doing things, then why come to me? Go find another teacher. And I've told some people that. Because they weren't willing to change. They weren't willing to have a more uplifted mind because they were so attached and thought they were doing it the right way. Okay. I have to have enough compassion to, for them to allow them to go and continue suffering. I can't take somebody's suffering away. I can allow them the space to have their suffering and I can love them completely, not with any heavy judgments in my mind. Just love them because they're there. That's what true compassion is. Not trying to take pain away from someone else. If you try to take pain away from someone else, you're going to make yourself suffer. And when you're suffering, how can you help them to overcome theirs? You're not being a very good example, right? So, learn to change. Accept the fact that you're going to change and you're going to get into some unusual situations that you've never experienced before because your mind is going to test you in all kinds of ways to see whether you have learned that or not. And it always comes down to keeping your precepts without breaking them. For some people to heal themselves is a very frightening experience because it's new ground that they've never walked on before. And maybe they'll sink into it who knows? Maybe they'll harm themselves. But that's just mind talking. Sutta number 35, uh, the Sachika Sutta, talks about the five aggregates. And the Buddha named each aggregate and said, Can you control that? Is that you? Is that yours? Of course, the answer is no. 
You can't control this stuff. That proves in itself that this is part of a process. It's not a personal process. Well, if it's not a personal process, who benefits from that? Well, you do. And everybody else around you, because you have given up your old ways of handling your habitual tendencies. And I don't want you to believe me. I have my own stuff to take care of. And I'm not perfect at it. If I was, I would be an arahat. And I promise you, I am not. Wish I was. But that wish gets in the way of everything. So, life is here so you can learn. There was a movie called Lucy. And Morgan Freeman was talking about what's the purpose of life. And he came up with the idea, cells talk to each other and one cell teaches a new way of doing something and it talks to something else. So from that, he said, life is about learning and showing others a different way, a way to exist that has less suffering in it. Amazing movie. It really is good. Highly recommended. Why? Because it has that truth in it. It is a Dhamma movie. And it has bizarre stuff in it. But it's just always coming back to that. What's the purpose of life? The purpose of life is to continue on and teach each other. Now, how do you teach each other? A lot of people think it's by talking, and it's not. It's by example. It's by, I used to have this emotional upset and got very angry, and now the same kind of situation comes up, and people see that you're not reacting in the same way. And then they want to communicate with you on what's different. How did you do that? But you always lead by example. And the more happy you become, the more you spread that to other people. And I do understand that there's a lot of political nonsense that's going out and a lot of trying to manipulate people into their mental state so that they stay angry so that things can get put over on them. Well, why be attached to some political view when you can show others the way to live. Now, David just got another, uh, bought another book on the cosmology of Buddhism and where it came from and how all of these things, these ideas started to manifest. And some of it is very accurate. Some of it, it, it cause, causes questions to arise. But, and you can believe it or not, but there were times 
when the earth was fairly young and devas used to come down and live on the earth because it was such a pleasant pace. And after a period of time, there's changes that started happening. And they started thinking about telling a lie. Now, before that, this was like a perfect place to live. Everything was in the right proportion and you had food and you didn't have to pay for the food. All you had to do was pick it up off the ground and eat it. And then they started getting this idea that they were going to tell a lie. And one of the devas decided he was going to take responsibility for that. Now, this is when their lifespan was very long like a hundred thousand years you can believe that or not i don't really care it's just the example that i'm giving and when they lied their lifespan went down to ten thousand years and then they started breaking uh, sexual precepts and devas were very much appalled at that and they wouldn't come down to this earth anymore And after that, there seemed to be a need for governments. And the lifespan gets shorter and shorter because of that. Because there was a lot more hatred. One, one group of people wanted to own what another group of people owned and they went in and stole it and, and killed people. Well, that shortens the lifespan. So now the lifespan is not very long because of not following precepts. But when you're an example of following precepts, you're helping other people to live longer and be more happy. And that's how you teach just like teaching one cell from another or to another. Now you can believe that or not. I don't care. But it does seem to make sense. And it gives you an idea of how historical things come to pass and how they change because of the historical things and how that's intertwined with your precepts. So, I didn't even get through the first part of the Satipatthana Sutta. <laughs> Well, let's, let's go to the last sentence of the Satipadana Sutta, because this to me is the most important part that has been ignored by people that are teaching meditation. He teaches and uh, he trains thus. I shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation. I shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. And this is important. Now you can take the breath and say, no, I don't want to do it with the breath. I can do this with loving kindness. I shall stay on my object of meditation and relax. Every time there's a distraction, I'm going to use the six R's. These are the same instructions with a little twist to them. 
but you know that the Buddha taught loving kindness meditation a lot more than he taught mindfulness of breathing. A lot of people did mindfulness of breathing because they wanted to follow exactly what the Buddha was practicing. But the Buddha came out and said that your progress in meditation is much faster with loving kindness meditation than it is any other kind of meditation. Sure, I can teach other kinds of meditation. I know them intimately. I've practiced them a lot. I know what happens when. And I know what's important and what is not. But if you want to just do, do mindfulness of breathing, you're not going to have as much personality development. Why? When you're practicing loving kindness, you practice it all the time. And that means with your daily activity. So you practice it more. And the more you practice it, the more of a habit it becomes, the more personality change there is, and the more equanimity you have. When you're practicing mindfulness of breathing and you're doing your daily activities, what are you supposed to do? Oh, I, I have this emotional state. Stop what everybody is doing. I have to take a breath and get mindful. It doesn't work as well. That's why the progress is not as fast. I have students, and they can verify this, that their progress in the meditation was faster in 10 days than it was years of mindfulness of breathing. What do you want to do? It's up to you. I don't like teaching mindfulness of breathing so much just because it takes so long for progress to occur. And the personality development is different than the loving kindness. Loving kindness is a bit softer. It has more compassion in it. It helps you to smile more easily. Although I do insist that people smile when they're doing mindfulness of breathing, which is a new concept in the world. It just doesn't work as fast. The end results can be the same. It is up to you. I have had some people come and they insist on continuing on with the mindfulness of breathing, fine. Until they start having, and then they start having insights that they'd never had before into how this process worked. And then they want to switch over to loving kindness. And that's great because they already have a deep understanding of how it works. It's just a little tweak in the, in the progress over to loving kindness. So it's your choice. And the end result of any kind of meditation that the Buddha taught is that you have let go of suffering and understand how this process works. Your life will become more content and at ease and basically more fun, a lot more laughing. And it's not laughing at things, it's laughing with things. 
just seeing some butterflies fly around can make me grin and, and laugh. Look at what they're doing. Isn't that great? And we have animals around here, wild and tame. But they always bring joy when I see them. And if they're not around for a while, I miss them. Is that an attachment? No, it's, it's just a wish for their happiness. It's compassion for them. So again, I've talked for a long time and I uh, feel like I've gone on to belong. So please, do you have any questions? Don't be shy. Thank you, Bante. Hello. Hello. Sorry, Amor, you go. Yeah. yeah. No, Hello. I just want to, yeah, I just want to say to Bante, I am one of the example that you have just mentioned and talked about. Like, I'm so grateful in the past few months that what I've been through from a different, like, uh, totally uh, path that I have uh, been trying to understand what's going on all along until I was like, by whatever reason I was got to uh, to uh, have you on YouTube, that I have such a beautiful, like, um, I don't know, it's maybe you're, you're saying that intuition that I know that this is the right yeah. way. And I, I, I dare to, uh, to continue and trial and uh, it makes a difference for me just so much like uh, that you have uh, been just telling mm -hmm. everyone and it is my personal uh, very deep hearted experience that I have been through in the past past uh, four months in meditation and past uh, nine months in uh, listening to your talks it, it has made such a uh, deep change that I have find so beautiful. And it is all about like what you are talking about. So I am so grateful. I am so heartily grateful. And I know that I have friends that can see the change. So it has Excellent. been a life-changing thing. It is very, it is, I don't know what to express, but I just want to let you know this. Thank you. Oh, thank and, you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bhante. It is, a, it is I something see, I don't know how to express, I see, but I, 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 I see in it, your yeah. face the change. Yes, I, I when I when I first saw you, you were sad. A lot of frowning. And yeah, you had deep lines in your face, and now they're gone. Isn't that you've become more beautiful? It's a relief, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bante, for your talk. You're welcome. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, just your opinion on, on this view. So I'm imagining if someone is new to TWIM and they are radiating loving kindness to their spiritual friend, and they want to know, how does this apply to the four foundations of mindfulness? And I imagine saying something like this. Uh, well, you observe the body because you observe tensions and you relax using the six R's in the body. Um, as far as feelings, you will notice, you know, pleasant, unpleasant, you know, or neither pleasant or unpleasant feelings in your body or to whatever comes up in your mind. And uh, you observe mind objects when you watch the hindrances, which are your teachers. Right. But when it comes to observing mind, you almost have to wait until you get to neither perception nor per neither non perception no, nor perception. No, no, no. Or how do they observe mind at an no, early stage? No, no, no. That's not. okay. It says in Cheta Nupasana which is mindfulness of mind, mm -hmm. that you see all of the jhanas. All of the jhanas. Uh, 
Okay, it does. It, it it says it in the commentary, so you can understand that it is talking about jhanas. Everything in the Satipatthana Sutta is talking about jhanas, and that's very much misunderstood. And a lot of people they think it's about. Uh, this kind of concentration or that kind of concentration. Sometimes they say, well, it's moment to moment concentration. And that's why I don't like the word because it's so misunderstood. It misrepresented what the Buddha was talking about. And there's no moment to moment awareness in the suttas, that is in commentary. So it doesn't match up with the actual sutta themselves. So to observe mind, one would have to be in a jhana? Right. Right. Okay, so a, someone who's just starting to win, you know, week one, uh, well, not even week one. Let's assume they haven't experienced jhana yet. Then we would say just keep practicing and then you'll observe mind as mind. It'll yeah. happen on its own. I wouldn't talk to them like that. They wouldn't understand it. I talk in more simple terms. Um, while you're sitting, do you experience joy? When the joy fades away, are you able to stay with your object of meditation a little bit more easily, more at ease? And uh, over a period of time, it starts to last a little bit longer. Now that's getting into jhana, but I'm not going to tell them that you're getting into jhana because there's too okay. many ideas okay. that aren't um, understood. You see, it's more for the the guide what is in each jhana so I can understand where you are and I can be able to talk to you in a language that you're going to be able to understand because you've had the experience. And that's the advantage of being with a guide and talking with them every day. A lot of people, like I, I know at IMS in, in Barry, Massachusetts, they only have an interview every other day, but it's not always with the same teacher. And it gets confusing. And as a result, the progress isn't as great as it could be, although there is some people that are successful with the way they're teaching. I'm not criticizing them. I'm just showing you an example of the importance of a teacher being able to see you every day and get to know you a bit so they can judge whether you're staying on the path correctly or not. That's all my job is, is to see whether you're staying on the path. If you start going away from that a bit, then I'm going to ask you questions so you can see that that's what you're doing and you can get back on the path yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bonte. Oh, you're very welcome. Could I comment? Hello. Debra? Hi. Hi. Hello. How are uh, you? Um, well, I've got a bit of a migraine today, so I'm off and on here, but I'm pretty good. But I wanted to share with you after healing the other person um, that um, uh, I've been doing forgiveness meditation with great dedication. And last Monday, I felt a real shift of letting go. And I guess I complete forgiveness of anybody and where they are. 
And the very next day, the person who I've had the most problem with phoned me and, and apologized. <laughs> and I thought, it's just like Monty <laughs> said, <laughs> you I didn't do it intending to get that. Right. I, and that's what I wanted to be really aware. I wasn't doing it for an outcome. Right. But I just thought, just like he said, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble here. <laughs> I, I have a question for you. Are you forgiving yeah. that headache? Not yet, but I will. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't usually get headaches. Yeah. So I, in fact, very rarely. So. But when, when you forgive it, then the, some of the aversion to that pain go, stops bothering you. So it, it lightens up and eventually it'll fade away, I hope. Yeah. I think there's a lot of tension. You know, I mean, this has been a, a family thing that's been going on for seven years. Seven years. <sighs> and to have that shift was just so, I mean, it's just, I just feel like crying. I just. <laughs> Excellent. I just can't believe it. I didn't think it would happen in this life. <laughs> and um, isn't it fun? Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> You're so welcome. And thank you for doing it. Well, it's the only thing that gave me a sense of a control or power or, you know, to just, um, I thought, to bring me into and huge equanimity. Ah. in a suite just just like whatever it is they're being themselves and i just have to let them be and just be as you said an example of stability mm. and love so you're on the right path i know <laughs> thank you wonderful thanks i should mention also one more thing okay my husband said to me the other day it's just unbelievable. You're just, you're just amazing. You've been just like, what, you know, you, the way you respond all the time, it's just amazing. It's <laughs> like, he goes, <laughs> so <laughs> that's helping him to change too. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, thank you. You're doing all the work. You well, give the, credit, but you're doing the work for well, it. Well, the guidance is very helpful. It's like you said. I mean, I was trying to follow some other practices, and it just it just wasn't creating the energetic change that. And it is an energy between people because we're all in this. It's just phenomenal. You think my energy changed, and that changed there. Like, how was I hanging on to them and keeping them down? It's <laughs> phenomenal. The attachments are. Very strange things. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you very much. Thanks. Uh, Bhante, uh, just uh, carrying on from that question about forgiveness meditation. Uh-huh. Uh, um, so I just want to uh, quickly uh, talk about my ex my uh, experience with forgiveness meditation, uh, with which I still need some uh, some guidance from you. Um, so I have been in some situations in which uh, people have behaved uh, in a rather insulting uh, fashion to me. And um, so I think I've evolved a little bit from uh, previously when I would just try to, uh, you know, to just respond in the same way and try to throw it back at them. Yeah. Uh, uh, to now where I realize in my moments of clarity that uh, that is kind of meaningless. Um, and um, I'm, I'm only responding to the emotions that that evokes in me, not to what they are saying. Right. Um, the, the problem is, uh, when I'm trying to do forgiveness meditation, um, I guess, despite the fact that I have this realization, I still don't really feel like I want to, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I want to forgive that person. Uh, and it's like, I need to have loving kindness in order to have forgiveness and I need to have forgiveness in order to have. Uh, so I, I don't really know. I mean, I feel like, like I'm a bit stuck here. 
Your problem is you're caught by your attachment to wanting to get even and some revenge and that sort of thing. Yeah. And it has to be sincere. You have to sincerely want to forgive somebody or you're going to be caught with not wanting. Your mind is going to play all kinds of tricks on you to distract you away from forgiving. Don't get caught up in the stories. Only stay with the forgiving and the relaxed step after you forgave. Okay? So you have a distraction, you're thinking about this or that person and what they said and you start to get involved with, I don't like what they said and all of that. Forgive yourself for doing that, forgive them. And then relax and come back and forgive them again. You wear them down that way. You wear down the uh, dissatisfaction, the aversion, the not liking. And you have to ask yourself, who doesn't like? Oh, it's me. Well, it's me because I have a hindrance in my mind and I'm identifying with that and causing myself a lot of pain. You're doing it to yourself, but you're looking to blame somebody else for your pain. It takes patience to overcome some of these kind of problems because they've been around for a long time and you did come from. And you did them for a long time. But now you're bringing a different awareness that is accepting of what it is. So you're more alive when you accept and you're more relieved when you finally, your mind will say, I really do forgive that person. I don't have any hard feeling toward them. And that will come but you need to have patience. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Bhante. Uh, just uh, on, on a lighter uh, note, I, uh, in the um, YouTube video, in uh, David's YouTube video for uh, forgiveness meditation, he tells um, the listeners not to go beyond the first jhana in, uh, in this right. meditation. And that's not a problem for me because I've never gone beyond the first jhana. So... No. Uh, it's not a problem. Okay. For some um, people, they've been doing it for a while and their mind wants to go to the, the next level, but you need to be able to verbalize while you're in the first jhana. Mm -hmm. And that, that's uh, Bante, forgiveness. Uh, can I just ask one more uh, question? Um, so I'm just curious uh, about... Uh, about this, uh, so I um, I know that uh, you know among humans the majority are neither um, you know entirely virtuous nor entirely um, you know sinful, uh, and they're uh, they're generally a combination of both, and um, so they they uh, develop habitual tendencies that are uh, you know human like because that's the form that they lived in in a particular uh, existence. So um, if those uh, 
I guess my question is, what is the normal expectation for, for an average human being in terms of what uh, form uh, that person will take uh, in, in the next um, existence? Um, well, that, that's hard to say because it depends on their actions for their whole life and what they got attached to and what kind of precepts they broke and how much that becomes difficult to uh, to say. But the Buddha said there are five different visions that happen right before you die. Oh, I spent a year with people that were dying in a nursing home. Every, about every week, there was somebody that was there, that was dying. And I would spend time with them if their family didn't object. And talk to them about the vision sometimes. Sometimes they would see a real scary uh, fire realms and uh, ice realms and things like that. Sometimes they would see a beast, kind of like a, a Bigfoot. You know what a Bigfoot is? It's, they, they say it's like an, uh, a, a gorilla, but stands more than seven or eight feet high. And it's covered with hair, just like a gorilla is. And they start dragging them off and they get into their, oh, their, their fears and anxieties and that sort of thing. And they're going to be reborn in that realm where it's not a pleasant realm to be in. And there's going to be a lot of things that are going to happening to them, limbs cut off every day because they'll grow back. And that, that's, it's just not pleasant. <clears throat> there is the animal realm, and you can have visions of animals, and you will be reborn as an animal. There is human realms where you are visited by past relatives that have already died. And you communicate with them and talk to them. I've been around quite a few people that they're talking and I, I said, well, who are you talking to? Well, I'm, I'm talking to my relative right over there. Okay. That means that they're going to be reborn as a human being. And there are some people that have lived uplifted lives. That doesn't mean they haven't broken precepts in, in the past. They did. But they're not as a big a problem. And there are ways that people can overcome some uh, wrongdoing. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're going to be reborn in a heavenly realm, and they'll have visions of some heavenly beings coming down in a chariot and picking them up, and they get exceedingly happy and they whisk off to one of the heavenly realms. Now, I, I've spent time with people that have had all of those different kinds of things. And what I tried to do, because they were Christian, I would read from the Bible. And I found out in the Bible that there are the precepts, the Buddhist precepts. So I would get them to recite the precepts, and that would uplift their mind. It's such a wholesome thing to do that they would be reborn in a high realm. And I tried to do that, but some people, they just, they didn't like it, they wouldn't do it, and or they would forget to do it even while I was reciting it. And 
they would be reborn in a lower realm. So that's the only kind of answer that I can really give you. And uh, to, me, you? It's, to me, it's real, but don't believe me. Be around people that die and see for yourself. See whether it's like that. Uh, which was the most uh, likely or the, the biggest group? Um, There's no most likely. It's a pretty small group that gets reborn in the heavenly realm, I'll tell you that much. Mm -hmm. Because of ignorance, because they don't know. And they might be reborn in an animal realm and be around f in different animals as they kill each other and they cause more unwholesome karma because of that and that keeps them there and they might be around for the thousands and hundreds of thousands of years in an animal realm before they wake up enough to re be reborn back into a higher realm. So, There's a lot more, it's a lot cr more crowded in uh, the Deva Lokas or in, in the Brahm, in the hell realms, in the Asura realms, the, the hairy black beast realms, than there is uh, in Deva Loka, which brings me to a joke that I've told before. I'm turning into Brahm. There was a guy that died and he had, he had kind of equal good and bad qualities. And he meets his guide around there and the guide says, well, what realm do you want to be reborn in? And he said, I, I, I don't know. Let's go visit him. So he goes to a heavenly realm and everything is really beautiful and people are flying around and uh, dancing and partying and having fun. And then he takes him down to one of the hell realms and it's all black and hard to see. And he... Uh, shows him this room and it's filled with excrement. And there's a bunch of people in there and they are whispering something to each other. And then he's the guy that's that just died is asked, which realm do you want to go through? You want to go to the heavenly realm and party and have fun, or you want to go down to this other realm? And the guy's curiosity got real strong, and he wanted to find out what these people were whispering. And he decided that going into this room that really smelled bad and it was hard to breathe, then it was filled with excrement but he wanted to find out what they were saying to each other. So he said, I'm going to go into this room. And he got into the room and he got close to somebody and they were whispering to him, don't make waves. So that's, that's the end of the joke. Don't make waves waves he gave up a heavenly realm to find out what that does so there's a lot of different kinds of heavenly realms if you want to find out more about that write to David he's our hell realm expert he's got a warped sense of humor <laughs> And that's not a bad thing. 
but there there's a hell realm that is like a big uh, metal pot that's filled with molten lead. And this guy, when he was uh, living his human life, he was having sexual activity with a lot of women that were already married and caused a lot of problems for a lot of people. And he was reborn in this hell realm with that molten pot. And he sank down to the bottom and it took 50,000 years to go down to the bottom. And then he would head back up and it took him 50,000 years to get up to the top. And he got to the top and he had enough time to utter one syllable of some word. And then he started back down again. Now, thinking about having your entire body uh, in molten, molten lead, that's got to be pretty painful. So he suffered for a long time. And again, you can believe these things or not. It's up to you. I'm not trying to scare you with these kind of things. But it can be an, an incentive that you do best when you keep the precepts without breaking them. Okay? Thank you, Pante. Okay. Anybody else? Hello, Pante. Hello. Hi. Uh, how are you today? You're really loud right now. Can you? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. It, it, how is it, this? Yeah, I, I can understand you more more clearly now. Okay, great. How are you today? Um, pretty good. How are you? Great. Happy spring. Yeah, I'm great. I was outside earlier, and there's lots of people kind of enjoying the spring weather, and you know, yeah. happy and smiling. So it's very nice. Yeah, it's good weather today. It's beautiful. Well, Bante, I have two questions. Oh, well, okay. I'll try to keep my voice down. I have two questions. Um, the first one is a practical question. So I'm planning on doing a retreat at Damasuka this year. Uh huh. Um, and you know, in the past, I've had um, I've had Lyme disease a few times from ticks. Um, so I'm really curious how you sort of approach ticks and how you deal with them there, and like. How you do tick safety? What's your approach? We, we give the animals these pills that is a repellent for ticks and fleas so they don't bother them so much. And we try to keep you on the paths, walking paths, not going into the forest because that's where the ticks and, tree, and, and fleas are. And we give you insect repellent. That's the best we can do. We haven't found another kind of mystical, magical pill that you can take and ticks won't won't bother you like the animals. That's great. But you're supposed to spend your time mostly sit, sitting anyway, so you'll be in, inside and you won't be troubled by the, the ticks. And we don't allow the animals mm. inside the meditation hall, so they're not going to, the ticks aren't going to come in. But we do have another, another beastie that is uh, kind of troublesome, and that is a uh, wasp. And they sometimes do come in, but we have catchers that we don't kill them. We can catch them and uh, let them go outside because that's where they want to be in the first place. Okay. Thank you, Bonte. 
Uh, my my second question. Um, last week I was asking you about intuition, and um, you had referenced a sutta where the the Buddha before his awakening was um, asking his intuition, and I think you mentioned Sutta One Twenty Seven. Um, but when I look that one up, it's the I think it's the Anuruddha Sutta Anuruddha, and right. Um, I'm wondering if maybe there's a that is the correct sutta. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, because I, I was maybe it was a version that I had, but I was reading it, and the Buddha is not actually didn't seem to be in that sutta at all. The Buddha isn't. The Bodhisattva is. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll take another look at it. Okay, try to get one of the later editions. Mm, okay. Thank you, buddy. As I remember, I've gone through all of the editions, and they that particular sutta is still the same. The bodhisattva is there, and he's recognized as a bodhisattva. And the Buddha is there, because the Buddha went to visit Anuruddha and uh, the other monks. And then they started talking to him about the meditation and how it didn't work for them. And they didn't know what the reason was, so the Buddha told them about intuition and how it works, because he gave the example of it working. Anything else? Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Uh, no, that is it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Then let's share some merit. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Well, I wish you all a happy week with lots of smiles and clarity of mind. Sadhu. Goodbye.